organized crime is becoming more and more important in uh, conflict settings. This is not just because of their um, economic implications or their economic importance. It's because they become more and more important political figures. Um, very much so through corruption and through, uh, through taking influence in political systems because they need to have a certain amount of backing for their uh, political backing, for their um, economic, uh, economic strategies. Now, this growing political role that organized criminal uh, groups have, specifically in conflict-affected and fragile states, does become a major concern for, uh, for, for Western donor community and also governments uh, of conflict-affected and fragile states because they are essentially undermining what is generally understood to be peace-building, state-building and development policies. So here, a very important item why we are speaking about conflict and crime today, which is that the political roles of organized criminal networks are becoming stronger and may undermine well-meaning Western uh, policy. There's another reason why it's important to speak about the uh, relationship between conflict and crime, which is that the strategic landscape of conflict is really changing. Traditionally, um, there has been a focus both in international organizations and specifically in, in government uh, about looking at interstate and intrastate armed conflict. But these two different kind of uh, predominant understandings of conflicts um, are no longer really a representative of the way violence and conflict is di distributed all over the world. Um, specifically, if we are looking at how many people die and how do they die in different contexts, only one out of every ten deaths is directly related uh, to, uh, to armed conflict understood in the traditional way. Essentially, crime is the supply of illegal goods and services um, or the supply of goods and services that may themselves be legal, but which are brought onto the market illegally. So, very straightforward. Um, it's related to essentially the imposition of uh, controls and laws by states and those who are willing to break that laws in order to make money. Uh, then, why do we speak about organized crimes? Which is that in order to maximize profits uh, in, and by breaking the law, uh, those who are, in fact, engaged in that business, they need to protect themselves and isolate themselves from law enforcement agencies and also from competitors. So this is why they need to become organized, and we're speaking of organized crime. Now, when do we start talking about transnational organized crime? Um, then the dimension of the criminal enterprise does have a cross-border dimension. Um, so, and this basically involves nearly everything because there is very few crime these days that is only related uh, to, the, uh, to a national domestic economy. Uh, the international criminal market is completely integrated into the global economy. And as some have also said it, it's really part of the fabric um, of global international economic uh, interactions. So, here we go. We have a rising political threat of organized criminal networks. We have a strange, changing strategic no, uh, notion. We have a tra changing strategic landscape of, of, uh, of conflict. And we have a very powerfully global uh, um, reach of organized criminal networks. If we want to go just a little bit deeper in understanding this relationship between conflict and crime, then let's zoom into two different issues. The first is, uh, let's have a look at what role violence plays for organized crime. And the second issue is, uh, let's have a little bit of a look at some of the policy implications of being uh, innovative on uh, relating and dealing with organized crime in conflict-affected and fragile states. One needs to develop a really nuanced understanding um, of violence and organized crime. The first is that organized criminal networks usually shy away from the overt use of violence. Now, this may be a little bit counterintuitive, because um, violence, particularly of those who work on conflict areas, seem to be an automatic part of organized crime. But no, um, violence attracts attention. Violence is not necessarily very effective in achieving commercial ends. Um, and this is why pre pre predominantly organized criminal networks are, do shy away from violence. Now, there are, of course, exceptions. And the exception is specifically if an organized group wants to enter into a specific market of a criminal enterprise, 
that is possibly been dominated by a competitor, then violence is very frequently used as a means of gaining market access. It is also used as a means of arbitration when there are conflicts between different organized criminal groups. Um, and here one may just point to the fact that, of course, disagreements between organized criminal groups are not reg regulated by any specific legal frameworks. And here there is still a very big item for violence to regulate and adjudicate also disputes, both between organized criminal groups, but also within criminal groups in order to assure um, that um, individuals are, uh, in, in fact, um, aligned according to a certain way an organized criminal group is organized. Now, there's a third way, which is to um, um, a certain way of working. And here, there is violence is mainly used as a sort of intimidation. Um, intimidation for individuals to pay ransom, intimidation for individuals to kind of to play by the rules of the game of the international criminal market. Uh, but again, that violence is not supposed to attract so much attention because attention is the item that organized criminal groups least want. Let's go to the second point, which we want to talk a little bit deeper about, which is the policy implications of dealing with organized crime in conflict situations or in conflict-affected and fragile states more, more broadly. Now, the first item is here, of course, that traditionally organized crime or crime in general is being dealt with by law enforcement agencies, the police, the courts, because, of course, what is part of their, uh, of what, what is part of the issue here is that organized criminal groups break the law, so they must be held accountable uh, to the existing laws uh, of, of specific countries. The countries where this lawbreaking occurs, though, uh, do have very frequently very poorly performing legal infrastructures. And it is very difficult to really use legal instruments in order to, uh, to follow uh, and to hold account um, actors involved in organized crime. This is why, specifically from a peace building and conflict prevention and perhaps from a political engagement modus, there has been a tremendous interest in uh, peace mediation and peace building communities about alternatives to dealing with uh, organized crime in peace building and conflict contexts. This is because this is recognizing the political power that organized criminal groups have and the way how one, one has to deal with them in order to, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve a reduction of violence or a, a, a specific peace agreement because they have a lot of power in specific context and specifically a lot of situational power because they are usually very well connected um, in the specific places where they operate. The additional item uh, specifically coming here from a peace mediation perspective is that outsiders involved in mediation and, and negotiation, they usually do not judge uh, individuals for whatever engagements they have had in a conflict area in order to mediate the exit of a conflict. And as many of you will know, it is very, very difficult to really associate or label a specific individual um, in, or, in, a, in an active conflict area or in, in, an, anflic, in an active uh, situation of, of, major, of, of major violent episodes. So here is in fact an issue that from the peace mediation perspective, it is, can be relatively normal to reach out to organized criminal groups and engage them as part of mediation processes or as part of... Uh, of, uh, of, of peace building strategies. The question is, who does the engaging? And the, the other issue is, how do you really, uh, or how can you confidently go about having all the evidence necessary to really prove that a specific individual has been involved in uh, activities that qualify as being organized criminal activities? So these are issues that are very tricky in many conflict affected and fragile states and also issues that require a much more a deeper context-sensitive analysis in order to really make sense. This is a question that really covers the essence of uh, the issue of what do we deal, how do we deal with innovatively with our actors involved in organized crime in conflict areas. It is very difficult to really prove that a specific individual is involved in organized crime and specifically in contexts where leading figures in a society have multiple identities and are involved in all sorts of items. They can be the heads of a rebel group, at the same time they are business people, and at the same time they have a seat in parliament. So here, um, there are anecdotes, many anecdotes uh, to say 
but this um, I will allow you to find out by yourself. Um, it is surely an, uh, a field of investigation that has received a lot of interest in the last two, two years and a lot more will be written on the relationship between conflict and crime in the next few years. Thank you very much.